culture. She served ethical societies in Chicago, Northern Virginia, and Brooklyn. She continues to serve as the leader at Brooklyn and at Riverdale Yonkers, where she began in um, March of 2015. Joan was raised in the Midwest and is a third generation humanist. Not many of us can say that. Uh, before turning to congressional leadership as a profession, Joan managed information technology education departments for several Fortune 500 companies. Joan is also an ordained Unitarian Universalist minister and served a congregation in Southwest Michigan and the Church of the Larger Fellowship as their first cyber minister. Joan is a graduate of Meadville Lombard, Lombard Theological School in Chicago and of the Humanist Institute, where she has served as a faculty member. She did her undergraduate work at the University of Chicago and has a BA from the Women in Management program at Mundelein College, the last private Catholic women's college in Illinois, founded by a justice-oriented women's <coughs> religious order. See, I told you those nuns. Okay. Please welcome Joan Johnson Lewis, who will give us this morning's platform, Ethical Heroes, the Goldmark Sisters. So I'm thinking we should do a quiz at the end of how many of the organizations mentioned in these first two categories in the back of your program I mentioned today. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see. Now I'm using a new method of speaking which requires technology, so we're going to see how it works. Okay, every year I aim to give one platform that's about um, a person in history who I believe is an ethical hero. You know, ethical culture has no sacred scriptures or divine origin story. As a community, we focus on human worth and human connection as the central ideas, ideals and values. As the words above the room in downstairs here say, it is where people seek the highest that we find holy ground. Thus, the story of how some person seeks the highest, honoring human worth and human connection in some deep way, is the closest that we have to sacred story. We can learn from other lives how to work for social justice, how to nurture human relationships, and how to bring out our own best selves. So this year, in speaking to the two ethical societies that I serve, and now as a guest here, I chose to talk about not one person, but a group. Four sisters that many of you have probably never heard of, unless you've been a student of progressive era history, or you've been around ethical culture a while, or you've heard of them from me because I'm a bit of a broken record on this, on this quat, quat, whatever they are, <laughs> the four women. You know, there's a systematic way that certain people are more hidden from history than others. For most of American history, the story is about named white men and unnamed people of color, unnamed women. And so we have now Black History Month and Native American History Month and Women's History Month to try to tell more of the story. But we don't have to wait for those months to do it. So today, four sisters. Each of them achieved a bit of notice in her lifetime and beyond, but all of them, their contributions didn't really rise to the level of being included in most history books, except as passing mentions or mistakes. And I'm going to talk about one rather humorous mistake a bit later. In this family, there were actually 11 Goldmark siblings. The four sisters weren't the only accomplished Goldmarks. So let me give you a little back background on the Goldmarks. Their father was Dr. Jacob Joseph Goldmark, known as Joseph. He was born in 1819 in what was then part of Austria and is now part of Hungary. Like some other members of the Goldmark family, he is buried in Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn. His tombstone notes, member of the first constitutional parliament of Austria. 
And then it has the quote, one whose voice rouses nations. One whose voice rouses nations. Someone with that quote ought to be known to us. I'm curious, how many of you know Joseph Goldmark's history? You know, he's another forgotten person. So let's go back for a minute to 1848. In that year, in many European nations and colonies, reformers and revolutionaries agitated for more civil freedoms and for political inclusion, ranging from peaceful reforms to armed revolutions. Great Britain, Germany, Poland, Ireland, Brazil, Denmark, Sicily, Italy, Switzerland. It was called the Spring of Nations. So ask yourself why you probably didn't hear about this in your history class. Dr. Joseph Goldmark was a physician and chemist, and he was part of the Austrian revolutions. Those, re re those revolutions that were nationalistic, seeking independence for various groups like Hungarians and Serbs was part of it, um, but those revolutions were also liberal or socialist revolutions opposing the reactionary politics of the Habsburg Empire. Joseph's mother had died when he was three. Joseph lived with his maternal grandparents for the next eight years in what is now Poland. And then Joseph returned to his father's home for what we'd call middle school. He went on to graduate from the University of Vienna with a degree in philosophy. He then graduated from medical school specializing in obstetrics. And then he went on to teach chemistry and did research at the Polytechnic Institute of Austria. In 1847, he presented a research paper on his invention with another man of a method to produce red phosphorus, a substance essential to making matches and also used in percussion caps in rifles. And then Joseph became involved in the 1848 revolution. For Joseph Goldmark, this was a fight for the freedom and rights of Jews, as well as a general fight for justice. And he wasn't just another fighter in that revolution. Joseph and his best friend, Adolf, and I'm probably gonna murder his last name, Fischoff, gave speeches in March of 1848, which are credited with beginning the Austrian Revolution. After Joseph gave that speech, he headed the student committee, he headed a student committee and then a, an organized military group of revolutionary students. And Joseph ended up with a seat in the new People's Parliament of Austria. And then the revolution was squelched quickly. The parliament was dissolved. Dr. Goldmark was among those sentenced to death for taking part in the revolution. He escaped and like many others in Central Europe at that time, he emigrated to America. So a little more back history of the Goldmark sisters and I'm gonna murder another name here, I'm sure. Another family that emigrated, fleeing after revolution and the ensuing repression was the Whaley family from Prague now in the Czech Republic, but then part of the Austrian Empire and part of the revolution. Gottlieb Wiley was an importer of dyes for use in printing cotton goods. In May of 1849, 26 members of that family left Hamburg for the United States. In America, their eldest daughter, Regina, married Joseph Goldmark. The family settled in Brooklyn, New York. Now remember that Dr. Joseph Goldmark as a physician and chemist in his youth in Hungary had with another man discovered red phosphorus. In America, Joseph founded a company to produce this red phosphorus called Goldmark and Conried. Red, phosphor bleh, red phosphorus became a key ingredient in munitions during the American Civil War. Dr. Goldmark took out several patents and the Goldmark family became quite wealthy producing cartridges that were used primarily by the Union Army. In Wikipedia's short biography of Joseph, you'll find only four of his 11 children listed. Those are the four daughters that are the subject of my talk today, because those are the four who are most well known, Helen, Pauline, Alice, and Josephine. But there were 11 children. Henry was the eldest. 
He became the chief engineer building the locks on the Panama Canal. Helen was the most famous, it turns out, but mostly for marrying Felix Adler. So yes, the family had a direct tie to ethical culture. Then there was also Christine, Angelica, Amelia, Emily, Susan, Alice, Charles, Clara, Pauline, and Josephine. There were some others who were famous in the extended family. Dr. Goldmark's half-brother, Karl, remained in Austria, where he was a noted composer. Another of the Goldmark sisters, not the four I'm talking about today, actually translated his writings into English. And a nephew of Karl and Joseph, so therefore a cousin of the four sisters I'm talking about, was Reuben Goldmark, born in New York City, known in his time as a composer, and now mostly known as the music composition teacher who taught both Aaron Copeland and George Gershwin. Another cousin, an engineer, was instrumental in developing the long playing record and color television. Quite a family. <laughs> so here we are after some context to the Goldmark sisters, because I think that context matters. These were women who were born to some advantage with family wealth that helped them to be able to become educated. Sisters from a family that continued to value social justice. In America, Joseph and Regina Goldmark were among those more rationalistic Jews of the time who did not join a synagogue. Instead, they joined the more radical of two Unitarian churches then in Brooklyn, the second Unitarian church then in Cobble Hill. They joined more for the activism and the ideals than for the religion. They were drawn by Reverend Chadwick's um, ideas, who, and he supported both abolitionism and Darwin's discoveries. The children of the Goldmark family attended the Sunday school there at Second Unitarian, and then some of the older ones became involved in what was called the Brooklyn Ethical Association, founded in the 1880s, died out in the late 1890s. But that met in the afternoons at the Unitarian Church. And they had been inspired in founding that by the New York Society for Ethical Culture in Manhattan. And just a personal note of connection, um, the last minister of Second Unitarian in Brooklyn, who was there until 1924, was Charles H. Little, whose widow was a member of my internship committee in the early 1990s. And the Unitarian Church in Chicago that I belonged to in my 20s and 30s was where Felix Adler spoke when recruiting people to start the first ethical society in Chicago. So lots of interconnections. The two oldest Goldmark sisters, Helen and Christine, were friends in their Sunday school days with Mary White Ovington, who became a settlement house worker and organizer and was one of the key leaders in the early years of the NAACP and was a trusted friend and colleague for many years of W.E.B. Du Bois. Ovington and the Goldmarks remained lifelong friends. It may well be through Helen Goldmark's long friendship with Mary White Ovington that her husband, Felix Adler, became friends with W.E.B. Du Bois. Often, Felix, with his wife, was a dinner guest at the Du Bois home and vice versa. Adler and Du Bois together conceived of the first Universal Races Congress, which met in, met in 1911 in London. Their friendship is the subject of a creative film currently in development sponsored by the American Ethical Union, and they're gonna be doing some filming in this building in August on that film. So of the four sisters that I'm gonna talk about today, Helen Goldmark was the eldest. When it came time for Helen to go to college, she took the entrance exam for Harvard University, despite Harvard's exclusion of women as students, and she scored among the highest scores. Helen, who was also known as Nell or Nellie, attended with her sister Christine a lecture at Second Unitarian by the young Felix Adler in 1879, and then went up to him afterwards and introduced herself. They were married in May of the following year in a Jewish ceremony, it turns out. Joseph Goldmark died in 1881, soon after Helen's marriage, and Felix took on a father figure role with the younger siblings. 
Helen Adler worked in support of her husband's work here at the New York Society for Ethical Culture. She also raised their five children. <clears throat> she did believe that raising children was a woman's most important work. And because she believed that, she also believed that such work should be informed by research and study. So in 1888, she and five other women at this society formed the Society for the Study of Child Nature. This became later the Child Study Association. And what the Child Study Association chapters as they developed did was they used study groups to look at education, at money, at sex education, at health, and at the issues faced by working mothers. Many of the early groups met in churches, settlement houses, and housing developments, and were meant to help mothers learn how best to raise their children. Eventually, these groups especially were among those mothers who were in poverty or who were new immigrants. Helen also wrote articles for The Standard, which was then the Ethical Culture Movement's magazine, and she volunteered with the new Visiting Nurses Service, an organization strongly supported by Felix Adler and involving another member of the Ethical Society, Lillian Wald. Mrs. Felix Adler, which is how Helen consistently referred to herself in public, worked at one point with a physician in New York City to develop ways to bottle milk more safely and thus significantly cut the infant death rate in the city for children of working mothers. She often did research for her husband's projects, and we know from his letters that he often ran his platform lectures past her first for comments and editing. She was hostess for the many parties where they entertained guests. Now, although to the embarrassment of many of us in the ethical movement, Felix Adler adamantly opposed woman suffrage, Mrs. Adler supported women getting the vote. And she had many friends who were leaders in that suffrage movement. Mrs. Adler was part of the women's group at the New York Society that at least twice had Susan B. Anthony here to speak. When Felix Adler spoke against woman suffrage at Carnegie Hall in a speech documented in the New York Times the next day, Helen Adler sat with her woman suffrage friends in the front row. <laughs> Often unacknowledged in our ethical culture history is the fact that the wealth Helen inherited certainly helped Felix Adler, whose family was comfortable but not so wealthy, to have the comfort and ease to do much of the work he did in ethical culture and as a professor. You know, in 1931, when Anna Garland Spencer died, she was the first woman leader in this movement. When Anna Garland Spencer died, it was Mrs. Felix Adler, not Felix, who was given the honor of delivering her funeral address. After Felix's death in 1933, Helen, by then living right around the corner from the Fieldston School in Riverdale, became involved with the Arts High School there and produced sketches, pottery, and textile designs. You know, Barbara Michaels, a few of you may know who she is, she was a longtime and founding member of the Riverdale Yonkers Society and also a member in Northern Westchester and a, a member, I'm told, here at the New York Society. And she asked me to pass along her story of meeting Helen Adler there at Fieldston. Mrs. Adler was frequently making clay sculptures in the pottery studio when Barbara took classes at the high school. Barbara says that Mrs. Adler did not work at the potter's wheel but worked um, on her sculptures simply by hand. And Barbara remembers her as a frail, somewhat fragile, pleasant, cheerful, and quiet woman. She used the word mouse-like, and she said she was often, quote, squeezing between us students, trying not to be in the way. Mrs. Adler didn't teach at Fieldson, although some biographical material says she did, um, but she worked on her own art projects there. One of her daughters did teach at Fieldston briefly. Helen Adler, Mrs. Felix Adler, died in 1948, age 89, 15 years after her husband had died. Now, Helen Goldmark's sister Alice was younger by seven years, and there were several children born in between. 
Another connection of the Goldmark family that's now important to mention, the Goldmark sister's mother, Regina, was a cousin of Louis Brandeis's mother. So the Goldmark sisters were second cousins of Louis Brandeis. They had known each other from childhood, though the Brandeis family lived in Kentucky. At a family gathering after the death of Louis's brother, Louis and Alice connected and began a romance. They married in 1891 at the Goldmark home. Felix Adler performed the ceremony. Alice also supported her husband through his career. Her health was often frail, and she was known by friends for frugally manage the, managing the family's finances. They lived in Boston, which event, with eventually a summer home in Dedham. Brandeis, you may know, was a leading figure in the progressive movement. A lawyer, he used his profession for social change and reform. He worked to oppose J.P. Morgan's takeover of the New England railroads. He took several cases in support of the early conservation movement. And he worked often for the rights of working people and the poor and against political corruption. He opposed monopolies and big corporations. One of his quotes about such concentration was that it was, quote, neither inevitable nor desirable. In 1908, Brandeis took on a case representing the state of Oregon, which had passed a law limiting the hours that women could work. This was a protection law that challenged the prevailing legal attitude that states could not interfere in what was seen as the freedom of corporations and employers to contract with employees and establish whatever working conditions the employers wanted. And I'm going to come back to that case in a little bit. But back to Alice. Mrs. Brandeis. She was also active with settlement houses. A friend of hers from that activity was Mary Parker Follett, who used meetings of women reflecting on their settlement house work, and meetings that included Alice, to develop her theory of power over versus power with, and who became a leading management expert of what was then considered the people's school of management as opposed to the efficiency school of management. After her husband became a Supreme Court Justice and they moved to Washington, D.C., Alice Goldmark Brandeis hosted many gatherings for liberal and radical politicians. She took part in the campaign defending anarchists Sacco and Vanzetti. She actively campaigned for Robert La Follette as a third party progressive candidate in 1924. As World War II approached, she was a public critic of American policy towards Jews and Palestine. <clears throat> so Alice, like her older sister Helen, was primarily a supporter of her husband, but she also became involved in projects and activism of her own. Now Pauline and Josephine were the two youngest of the 11 Goldmark siblings. 10 and 13 when their father died, Felix Adler actually was their father figure through most of their childhood. Neither Pauline nor Josephine ever married. Both of them became part of the larger progressive movement. Both became associated with the National Consumers League, or NCL, which at its inception fought for both consumer and worker rights, and especially for the rights of working women. It was associated with the movement to establish a 10-hour day for workers and to establish minimum wages both of which were actually attacks on the prevailing attitude of the Supreme Court that any interference with corporations and their contracts with employees was unconstitutional. The League worked for regulation of child labor as well, and Felix Adler, who was Helen's husband, served as the first president of the child, National Child Labor Committee, which was also supported by the National Consumers League. You know, the strategy of the time to get progressive legislation around work passed, and especially to get a shorter work day and minimum wage in the face of court oppression, was to begin to work for those reforms for children and women first. One strategy of the National Consumers League that both of these sisters worked on was to convince middle class women consumers to only purchase items produced with fair working conditions. 
Labels and clothing verified that the factory used to produce the item complied with wage and working condition standards. Another name associated with the National Consumers League was Florence Kelly. She was also active in this ethical society, and you'll hear more about her in a bit. Both Josephine and Pauline had been advocating for worker safety and a shorter workday when they learned through the National Consumers League of that case I mentioned earlier. Oregon had established a 10-hour workday for women, and the corporations took it to court. Corporations sued to prevent the law going into effect. The case was on its way to the Supreme Court as Muller versus Oregon. Josephine and Pauline convinced their brother-in-law, Louis Brandeis, to take the case. And then Louis asked the two of them to do research for him. The work that they did created part of that legal brief, which many now know in legal history as the Brandeis brief. Although Lewis wrote three pages of legal citations defending the Oregon law, and the Goldmark sisters wrote over 100 pages of citations to research and data about the effect of long working hours on women and especially on mothers. Brandeis and his sisters-in-law in this case actually prevailed. It was the first Supreme Court decision that accepted social, historical, and scientific data in addition to legal citations, and was thus a landmark decision for that reason. That laid the groundwork for later cases that also used social history, such as Brown versus Board of Education and Roe v. Wade. Muller versus Oregon was also a landmark decision for affirming the state of Oregon's right to limit working hours and thus limit corporate power. The role of the Goldmark sisters, Pauline and Josephine, was so substantial in that brief that one of the reference books on legal decisions that describes the case refers to Josephine as Justice Goldmark. <laughs> Both Pauline and Josephine made their mark in social justice work primarily as solid researchers. Pauline became associate director of the Bureau of Social Research of the New York School of Philanthropy and that School of Philanthropy is now known as the Columbia University School of Social Work. She also served on the New York State Department of Labor's Industrial Board, managing enforcement of labor laws, as well as researching to see what new laws might be justified. In 1911, when the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire took the lives of many people, most of them women and immigrants, Pauline Goldmark was on the investigating commission and wrote two of the reports which led to legal reforms of factory conditions. Pauline worked for the US Railroad Administration, supervising over 100,000 women workers. She worked for several other organizations as well, researching issues of health related to working women. Now, Pauline was also a confidant and friend of William James and a frequent correspondent of his. From those letters, we learned that a young Pauline was a hiker who loved the out of doors. She met William James, who was summering in the Adirondacks when she was 24. He was 54 and married. He seems to have developed what's referred to in all the literature as a chaste romantic friendship with Pauline, documented in several biographies of James from 2006 and 2007. We do know that besides her books on research topics, she also compiled a book of poetry to be read at the campfire. I managed to find a copy of that used some years ago. Uh, most of the poems were of the more formal style that was popular 100 years ago. And about a quarter of the poems in this book are not in English. They're German, Latin, French, etc. I imagine that those poems were likely read around the campfires in the summer on vacations with the Goldmarks, with Felix Adler and Louis Brandeis often in attendance, and sometimes William James and Florence Kelly there as well. And that brings me to Josephine Goldmark, who I admit is my favorite of the sisters to learn about. She graduated from Bryn Mawr by the time she grew up women's colleges. It, were much easier to, to get into than with Helen's um, time. 
And she then went to volunteer with the National Consumers League. She, like her sister Pauline, was mainly a researcher, writing technical studies about labor laws, child labor laws, women's health, and safety in the workplace. She was, as I mentioned, one of the key researchers and writers of the Brandeis Brief, a turning point in American legal history. Josephine was also part of the investigation of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire and followed her sister Pauline in heading up the women's service section of the US Railroad Administration, where they were responsible for 100,000 working women. Josephine Goldmark became focused in later life more on nursing education. And was, at one, and was at one time head of the New York Visiting Nurses Service, which I mentioned earlier was founded by Lillian Wald in which, and in which Helen Goldmark was an early volunteer. Josephine's nursing research affected the curriculum of nursing schools of the time. Josephine also later wrote a book about her family's political involvement in the Prague and Vienna revolutions of 1848 and about their subsequent emigration. Another of her books, which is not often known or read, examined how Denmark used government intervention in service of democracy. Josephine was working on a biography of Florence Kelly when she died. It was later edited and published as Impatient Crusader. Both Pauline and Josephine are known more for their own accomplishments rather than like Helen and Alice, mostly known for supporting their husbands. I said earlier that Pauline and Josephine never married, but you know, it's not like they didn't have relationships. Pauline had that lengthy platonic romantic relationship with William James. Josephine had a long time committed relationship with Florence Kelly, the head of the National Consumers League. Josephine and Florence lived in what was then called a companionate marriage. We today would recognize it as a committed same-sex partnership. So there you have the four sisters, two who were crucially important in legal history, all four of whom were involved in social justice work and particularly in trying to apply research methods to make for better social reforms and social justice. All were part of the larger circle, working for progressive reforms from labor rights to racial justice. All four supported extending the vote to women and were willing to be publicly identified with that stand, even though one of them had a husband who was quite publicly opposed. Ethical heroes, individuals who stood up for social justice and the rights of those most deprived in their time of rights, and individuals who also remind us of the power of human connection to fuel the work of social justice and personal ethics. Their sisterhood helped empower them and their family history and relationships and friendships connected them to struggles beyond their own, reminding us of how interconnected all these struggles were. They were women of their time, struggling for human dignity for all in the ways that they had access to struggle in. They were also women who understood the value of bread and roses in the lives of women and in the lives of others. They changed history, even if we don't know the ways that they did it. And they led good and full personal lives as well. They leveraged the advantages that they had in life to make life better for others as well. Definitely the kind of seeking the highest that can serve as a model for those of us who also won't be stars and celebrities in the history books of the future, but can make a big difference with the volunteer and paid work that we do in our lives. So I'm gonna close with two quotes from that friend of Alice Goldmark Brandeis I mentioned earlier, Mary Parker Follett. No individual can change the disorder and iniquity of this world. No chaotic mass of men and women can do it. Conscious group creation is to be the social and political force of the future. And she also wrote, to free the energies of the human spirit is the high potentiality of all human association. Thank you. <laughs>